All right, everybody, we're finishing up the Baltics with our last Baltic country. If you didn't watch the Latvia episode, it basically goes like this. Don't play with us, Estonia. Welcome to the creepier Baltic sister, Lithuania. It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host, Barbs. Okay, once again, I know some of you guys are kind of like, come on, Barbs, stop calling the two countries creepy. But my response to that would be, it's kind of true. And it's not necessarily a bad thing if used in a charming way. Some people like creepy. I mean, just capitalize off of it. I mean, like, Latvia made that prison hotel. Turkmenistan did that thing with the burning hole. Belize made bank off of whale vomit. <laughs> Who knew that stuff would be so expensive off the market anyway, huh? Cha-ching! Okay, we need to get back to Lithuania. Let's find out where it is now, shall we? Now, Lithuania may be the largest Baltic country in size, but it kind of got the short end of the stick when it came to coastline. First of all, the country is located in the area of Europe known as the Baltic, which, no shocker, borders the Baltic Sea to the north. The nation is divided into 10 counties, with the capital Vilnius located in the south. They are also surrounded by four countries, remember this little chopped up exclave Kaliningrad belongs to Russia, in which they share this long, famous stretch of land known as the Koronian Spit, a 98 kilometer long sandy barricade with dunes, about 54 kilometers of which belong to Lithuania, and it all effectively cuts off the entire Kar Lagoon, except for this small opening at the port of Klaipeda. This is literally where almost all seabound shipping comes into Lithuania. I mean, come on, nobody's gonna deliver cargo at that dinky little dock at Palanga. So essentially, Russia has the bigger portion of the lagoon, but Lithuania has the only way out. Eh, we don't need. We have opening at Vistula Lagoon on Strait of Baltisk. It has funny looking star fortress thing to welcome you. Oh, Russia, I can't wait to do your episode. The largest cities after Vilnius are Konus and the city we just talked about, Klaipeda. And surprisingly, for such a small country, they actually have four international airports, the busiest in order being Vilnius, Konus, Palanga, and Sholai Internationals. Now here's the thing, Lithuania is proud to claim that they, debatedly, have the geographical center of Europe. Like, they literally even built a monument and sculpture park next to showcase it. Nope. Uh-uh. Wrong. No. Ha! <laughs> no. Really? Hungary? Even you? Yup. No. no. I mean, the Guinness Book of World Records recognizes my village of- No. no. Make of it what you will. The country doesn't really have any territorial anomalies or disputes except for kind of a maritime dispute with Latvia up north, something about oil reserves. Then there's that weird salient that juts into Belarus. I think we already talked about that in the Belarus episode, did we? And let's not even get started on how Lithuania was like, eh, I'm just gonna take this Dievenishku Isturinis National Park from you guys, even if it does give me like a one mile wide corridor to reach it. Huh, yeah, we did. Huh, well, cool. I guess I don't have to discuss it. Minimal effort! Funny enough, there's a micronation in Lithuania, the Republic of Utspis, which is actually just another one of those bohemic hippie-ish neighborhoods in the capital Vilnius. They kind of want it to be edgy and cool, much like Freetown Christiana that we studied in the Denmark episode. <laughs> Self-proclaimed but unrecognized autonomy is like... So dope. Lithuania does kind of have a dark past. I mean, they did play a huge role in the Holocaust during World War II. They had one of the most significant Jewish populations in Europe, once nicknamed the Jerusalem of the North. Nearly the entire population of about a quarter million was killed by Nazis with a huge massacre at Ponari. Many were sent to the HKP 562 forced labor camp in Vilnius. Today, various memorials and museums and exhibitions can be found to commemorate the incident. Also, due to the high emigration rate after joining the EU, many towns started to see houses and buildings and properties left unattended and decaying, like the Nalia nuclear power plant, the Palace of Sports and Concerts, the Trade Unions building, the Plokštine nuclear launch site. Yeah, nuclear launch site. So yeah, that kind of sets the mood, right? Oh, and they also have a Devil's Museum and a KGB experience in a former Soviet bunker where you can pay to pretend to be a prisoner getting yelled at and interrogated, complete with guard dogs and everything. Charming! Speaking of which, some places of interest might include, and keep in mind, I will not really pronounce these Baltic words because they're so hard. These castles, this monastery, the Liberty Boulevard, the Hill of Three Crosses, the Monument of the Victims of Fascism, the Funicular Railway of this place, the Museum for the Blind, the Cat Museum, the Museum of Illusions, the Frank Zappa Memorial, the Pan House, the Orvidas Garden, and finally the two most iconic cultural landmarks that might really give you a feel of what Lithuania is all about, the Hill of Crosses, which has over 100,000 crosses, and nobody really knows why it got started that way. And even though the Vatican says it's a holy place full of power, the locals think it's kind of creepy, and the Hill of Witches, a sculpture park with sinister looking carved wood images depicting characters from ancient Lithuanian folklore from back in the pagan days. So yeah, Lithuania is kind of like a weird, pagany, Catholic-y, forest-loving, technology-advancing, but kind of reserved and overcast country. So much to cover. Let's start with those forests. <laughs> Well, here we are again for the third time explaining basically the same thing that we discussed in the Latvia and Estonia episodes. I know you're gonna be tempted to skip through this section, so to keep you watching, here's Keith on base. Is that all you want? Lithuania, or Lietuva, gets its name from 
Vietus Va, which means rain here, symbolizing the abundance of rain and fertile land. First of all, the country is made up of four general parts, the flat coast, the slightly higher uplands, the middle lowlands, and the Baltic highlands. Here you can find the tallest point, Aukštoyas, at only about 293 meters in elevation, making Lithuania the flattest of the Baltic states. Amidst everything, at over a third of the country, you will find, just like the other Baltic states, a plethora of boggy marshland and swamps, as well as forests, the longest river being the Neman, which starts in Belarus, flowing through Konus, blocking into the Konus Reservoir. However, the largest lake would be Lake Drukshai, shared partially with Belarus. Wait, did I mention that in the Belarus episode? Also, you have an island split between Belarus and Lithuania in Lake Ryčiu, and two islands and two peninsulas in Lake Drukšie or Drisvati. Dang, I did a good job in the Belarus episode. I'm making my job so much easier for me. Oh, and the national animal is a stork. Lithuania also has the highest nesting density for storks in the world. They believe it's good luck if a stork nests near your house. They even have a holiday dedicated to them on March 25th. So anyway, resources. One thing that Lithuania is famous for is amber. The Baltic coast has the largest known natural amber deposits in the world, and Lithuania was pretty much the place where it all started in the town of Yudkrante. I'm not even gonna try that again. Otherwise, much of the land is arable, over a third is cultivated. Some national dishes of Lithuania might include things like cold beet soup, stuffed cabbage rolls, that Kastinis dairy product thing, anthill cake, tree cake, poppy seed rolls, blood soup, and Lilliputas cheese. Para todos los que hablan español, sí, sí, lo escuché también, cálmate a todos. And probably the most iconic dish, potato dumplings. Phew, got through that section. Now, let's meet the Lithuanians, shall we? <laughs> Nah, Lithuanians are fine and dandy like cotton candy. Remember that Lithuanian geography Giedra that I met in Tokyo? She was cool. Hey Giedra, I literally tried to hit you up for this episode to get some information, but I, I couldn't find your email. I don't know, if you're watching this right now, let me know what you think. Was it accurate? So anyway, the country has about 2.8 million people and is the largest economy in the Baltics with the highest GDP as well. The majority of the country at around 88% identify as ethnically Lithuanian, about 6% are Poles, 5% Russian, and the rest are other groups, mostly Slavs like Ukrainians and Belarusians, with a few other minority groups mixed in as well. They use the Euro as their currency, the Type C plug outlet, and they drive on the right side of the road. Now, if you really want to get a feel of everything Baltic, Lithuania is kind of like the epicenter. The Baltics were like the last places in Europe to convert to Christianity, and to this day, like Latvia and Estonia, ancient pagan traditions and folklore still live on through festivals, artwork, and traditions. In a nutshell, though, Lithuania was more Catholic influenced and Latvia was more Protestant influenced. Lithuania joined Poland in a commonwealth and became at one point the largest country in Europe, while Latvia was taken over by the Germans and Prussians and whatnot. First of all, the language. As mentioned before, Latvian and Lithuanian are the only two surviving Baltic languages left in the world. Their older brother, Old Prussian, died out in the 1800s. And these two languages are ancient, like older than Greek. Half the words and names end in S, and like half of everything ends in like Onus or Ites. Lithuanian is disputably the oldest Indo-European language still in use. Some say it even still retains words that were related to ancient Sanskrit originated in India. Yeah, India. For example, Agnis versus Umnis, Vayus versus Vejas, Devas, Dievas, and the list goes on and on. It's pretty strange how close the coincidence is when you look into it. Oh, and to say thank you in Lithuanian, all you have to do is sneeze. Like, literally, the word for thank you is achu. Now, if you don't know anything about the Baltic, this region has the highest ratio of two things, blonde-haired, blue-eyed people and women to men. The numbers usually switch off every so often, but Lithuania usually ranks second or third between Latvia and Estonia when it comes to male and female ratios, ranging between 0.88 males for every female. This is partially due to a number of factors, such as large portions of the male population being killed off during war times, mortality rates caused by things like smoking or alcoholism, and suicide. Here at Geography Now, we don't gloss over the controversy, but try to report it as objectively as possible. And unfortunately, Lithuania often ranks in the top three suicide per capita nations in the world, many times first. In a weird way though, this dark fact has kind of put a sort of weirdly romanticized image on Lithuania and Lithuanians to the point where the people just kind of shrug and own up to it. I mean, this dude invented a euthanasia roller coaster concept designed to kill the passengers, and Lithuania was selected to be the childhood home of fictional character Hannibal Lecter. Add some pagan statues juxtaposed to thousands of overly ornate crosses in a swampy land, and bam, you have the perfect setting for... <laughs> no, but seriously, Lithuania is not all jump scares. It's more of like a legendary place where ancient customs still live on with a valiant populace that became the first to break away from the Soviet Empire. And they love basketball. Speaking of which, history time. In the quickest way I can put it, pagan tribes, this guy unites them all and becomes king, like literally the only king in all their history, wars with the Teutonic Order. The 1400s, it becomes the biggest country in Europe with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. They briefly colonized parts of Africa, 
Africa and the Caribbean, colonies sold off and lost, divided by Russia, Prussia, and Austria, book smuggling years to keep their language alive, quick independence in 1918, but then the Russians came in again, Nazis tried to take a go, back to the USSR, bloodiest guerrilla war in European history, over 30,000 Lithuanian men die, singing revolution with all the other Baltic states, independence finally in the 90s, joins the EU and Eurozone, they somehow became the basketball capital of Europe, and it's almost like a religion to them, and here we are today. And speaking of basketball, some famous Lithuanians might include all these basketball players. And this one is probably the most famous. This guy who's supposed to be like the king but died before it could happen. Painter Mikolojus Konstantinas. Director Jonas Mekas. Writer Salomeas Neris. Virgilus Alekna. Celebrities with partial Lithuanian heritage, but it still kind of counts to Lithuanians, might include Jason Sudeikis. Charles Bronson. John C. Riley, Sean Penn. Sasha Baron Cohen. Bob Dylan. William Shatner. Pink. Anthony Kiedis. And before we finish off this segment, some last minute factoids. Instead of the Easter Bunny, they have an Easter Grandma. They have the highest number of hot air balloons per capita. They have their own national perfume scent. They have some of the fastest internet in the world. It's considered bad luck to whistle inside of a house. Otherwise, it'll explode and burn down. And yeah, that's about it for now. Lithuania, let's talk about their friends now. Lithuania is the largest of the Baltic states, but often the least publicized. Nonetheless, some countries have managed to make their inner circle. Of course, as a member of the EU, most of their trade and business goes through their neighbors, especially through Germany and Sweden. Iceland was the first country to recognize them after independence. The two get along great. They even have a street named after Iceland. The US, Brazil, and the UK each have the largest expat communities outside of Lithuania, which has only strengthened ties over the years. I just found out my hometown Los Angeles has a little Lithuania district. They love Georgians and Ukrainians because they share the same history of being part of the former USSR. They support them in any kind of political movement against Russia. They even send foreign aid. Poland is like the ex-boyfriend that they started out really happy with, but then they fought and broke up. But over time, they moved on and are just friends now. Estonia is like the childhood friend that they got along with really well, but after graduation, they kind of moved on and Estonia got more and more obsessed with Finland. In the end though, their best friend, no shocker, would be their little twin sister, Latvia. Even though the years have caused the two to grow up a little differently, they still moved forward, keeping traditions alive, sharing the old mystical Baltic charm. In conclusion, Lithuania is the larger of the last surviving Baltic peoples on the planet, and it's quite amazing how they've held it all together to this day. But seriously, if you don't want to become extinct, start making babies. You too, Bulgaria. Those diaspora emigration rates are quite alarming. Stay tuned. Luxembourg is coming up next.